looking forward to moving along the budget process. Uh, the House um, yesterday accepted the amendment to add, to restore $19 million to the university budget, which previously had been cut. And um, as was mentioned in both speeches by Rep uh, Senator Murkowski, she referenced microgrids and all the great work that's coming out of the university, especially in the area of microgrids. And uh, Senator Sullivan mentioned um, Arctic research and how the university is leading the world in Arctic research. And so both these things kind of um, come back home and come back to the university, and uh, which I'm very um, enthusiastic to hear. Also, uh, energy, <clears throat> which I chair the Energy Committee. Um, the microgrids especially relates to uh, rural energy, and um, I've introduced a bill recently for the rail belt energy system and how to make it more efficient and let more um, producers of wind and solar to let them onto the grid and uh, be more like the rest of the world. So I think that'd be great. Ready for questions, and as always, please state your name and your affiliation. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Uh, question for the finance folks, but in general, you've got the fast track budget bill coming up to the floor later this week. Um, thoughts on that, why it's needed this year, um, why it's been a few years since we've seen one. Well, the fast track supplemental is just exactly what it says, fast track, because there are known items that uh, the budgets are known, they're uh, short of money. Uh, from last year, and so these are items uh, that all of the four co-chairs of the finance committees on both the House and the Senate side uh, have uh, agreed are non, uh, there's non-contest among them. There, there's not a philosophical debate, it's, it's just money. And so that's why um, those can be aggregated and go on a faster track, take those things off the table, the um, fast track that we have right now would eliminate about nine pages from the capital budget in the end, and that's very helpful to make that smaller so there aren't so many things on the table at the end. It's very much a process question. As the budget gets tighter and tighter, you know things are going to come up that are more important in the fiscal year, and it's just a way of addressing them in a way that takes care of them faster than, everything, than the course of everything else. <clears throat> Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. Perhaps first Representative Wool, and then if anybody else wants to weigh in, you've made uh, comments in, um, you, well, in questioning Senator Murkowski. Um, you were pretty passionate in asking about school safety issue. The governor said yesterday he wants to uh, have a, a roundtable of his advisors talk about things that might that the state might be able to do. Garantar has a bill up tomorrow dealing with gun protective orders. Do you see that as something that the state, that the, that the legislature should look seriously at? Or are you talking with one of the committees? Or are you looking for, I guess, where are you sort of looking um, here for you know, where the discussion might lead? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I still have a little cold. Um, I think the issue has a lot of sort of facets to it. Um, of course, there's the federal laws that, that probably much of the change has to happen, but the state laws can, can affect change too. Um, uh, I'm familiar with Representative Tarr's bill and I'll be more familiar after hearing more hearings on it. I think all these things are incremental steps that, that could help. Um, my question to Senator Murkowski and I, and I led with a bunch of pharmaceutical examples. I don't know if you remember, but you know the, um, the fact that you have to s sign up or, or show your ID to get um, antihistamines because of the methamphetamine crisis and opioid registration. Your doctor or pharmacist has to put you in a database because the opioid epidemic. And then, of course, the Tylenol incident in the 80s where people were being, people were being killed from someone poisoning Tylenol. And those are all sort of health issues. And, and I, think the, um, I think the gun death massacre issue, whatever you want to call it, it, it is becoming, it's a public health issue where, where people are dying. And I think we have to look at it in, in those terms and not so much as, you know, should I t not use this type of gun or should I, you know, arm teachers, which I personally do not support at all. But um, I think we have to look at it as, as public health because people are dying just like car accidents for a while, you know, the death rate from car accidents has gone down incredibly and we've done things to, um, 
policy changes that have changed that. And I think we have to look at, at gun violence in, those, in that same lens. And I would just like to add uh, that, you know, we are doing some things here. We've added a, a position in with Mental Health uh, Trust Authority uh, that will be coordinating with providers to make sure that there's adequate um, follow-up for all of their uh, work, the um, kind of a care coordination models. Uh, and, uh, you know, that makes those more effective. But I don't want to just say that this is mental health problems. Uh, we have in our schools, principals have talked to me uh, across um, much rural Alaska that is using restorative justice. So instead of suspending students, which creates anger and, and depression displacement, um, what they're doing is having talking circles and working these things out. And there's a really good um, uh, results from that and in fact in my school district the flex school has just started that and has had success with that and so it may be spreading to the rest of the schools uh, as other pilot projects so addressing those on the upstream side is important as well uh, Steve Quinn with KTVA News you mentioned the cap um, the capital budget and I know the capital uh, the coach who handles the capital budget <clears throat> uh, isn't up there but just the same have you um, any plans to hear the governor's bill for the payroll tax that is supposed to be uh, covering capital projects? Well, not, not at this point. Uh, the sequence, uh, the normal sequence of events is to, of course, hear the operating budget, which is a huge project unto itself. And then uh, once that's through the House, uh, then at some point to turn to the capital budget. That's the, the normal sort of progression of events. The added twist, as you mentioned, is the fact that the governor's budget has uh, the Economic Recovery Act in it, which is tied to the 1.5% payroll tax. So that's uh, uh, probably going to require additional debate. Uh, I shouldn't speak for the co-chairs, uh, but uh, at this point, uh, I don't think there's any plans to hear the capital budget. Um, not, not at this point. One, one of the problems with the idea is using um, the, uh, a tax on wages and self-employment income tax <clears throat> and not solve any of our budget deficit problem. In other words, all of the money is going towards capital problems, uh, and we don't solve any of the deficit problem, uh, which is the difference between our revenues and our expenditures. And here we are talking about, you know, one of our, our most effective tools and then using it for something else other than that. So that will be a debate that has to come. Last year, the House passed a fully funded part of a fiscal plan inside of 90 days. Those components are still on the table. We committed to something that that um, closed a bunch of gaps and put a fiscal plan on the table. That's really important. I mean, that was a, a, a huge step for, for the House to do, and that's still there. Those co components are all still available. Uh, two quick ones for Representative Wool on individual bills. I saw that the uh, Alcohol Control Board extension bill had been pulled. What's the status of that? And um, I wanted to get your thoughts as a bar owner on the distillery bill. <laughs> uh, let's see, question number one on the uh, board <clears throat> extension. I, I, um, I just wanted to look into one issue, which was when the Alcohol Control Board was moved from public safety to commerce, and that was done to sort of make it more business friendly and less sort of enforcement heavy or enforcement focused. Um, so in my experience as a license holder and other people, and it came up in um, committee and it came up uh, in labor and commerce and in finance, which, which is their priorities and prioritizing how they do enforcement. And I just want to make sure that they are on a commerce um, sort of side as well as, as enforcement because it seems like sometimes they're mostly, they still maybe in the Department of Public Safety mindset. Um, part two of your question, I, you know, I get a lot of emails about the sort of tasting room issue and um, I've certainly thought about it quite a bit. I, as a license holder who spent, you know, $100,000 and, and other cities, they're two or $300,000. I, <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that those license holders want to protect the value of their license and the value of their business. So 
and I also respect that manufacturers have a you know businesses to look after as well. So I, I want to keep everybody happy. I I think in the end, either through uh, Representative Tuck's bill or, or Title IV rewrite, which I hopefully will get to this session, we can address some of these issues and, and come up with a sort of common ground. But um, I think when the bill was initially passed, the tasting room bill, um, and uh, it was stated that it was not supposed to be a de facto bar, but an ancillary stream of income for a manufacturer. So I, I support that. Becky Bohr with AP, um, Representative Wool, popular person. <laughs> um, just to get back, you mentioned um, thinking that the, the gun issue um, with shootings needs to be looked at as a public health issue. I just want to make sure I understand. Are you are you talking about looking at more mental health? Just how do you get your arms around what what that means as a public health issue and do you think then the leadership has to come from the federal government or does the state need to be more aggressive itself? Um, well, I think what I meant was, for example, there, there used to be research money for the CDC, Center for Disease Control, that, that was used or able to be used for researching gun violence, for example. And there was a bill that went through the Senate, the U.S. Senate, that um, rescinded that funding. And, and some people are looking at that as maybe we should put that back in. And, you know, there was <clears throat> questions uh, the Surgeon General some years ago had on his list of questions for, for a child and safety at home. And one of the questions was, is there a gun in your house? Because statistically, if there's a gun in your house, you know, kid, there's a statistic probability that you may get shot more than if you don't have one. And that question was taken off the table for political reasons. So I think some of this, the politics needs to be taken out of looking at certain statistics. And I guess if there's research done, if there's funding for research, that would go a long way. Um, so that's more of a federal thing. On the state level, yes, uh, as Representative Seaton said, the way the schools are, are treating um, kids that are, that are having problems, instead of just throwing them out, um, mental, mental health is definitely a factor, and we need to look into that. But <clears throat> it's not the only factor. And as I mentioned to um, Senator Murkowski, you know, the U.S. doesn't, there's not like we have a lot more mentally ill people in this country than in other countries, but we have a lot more um, mass shootings. So I think we have to look at it objectively. Additional questions? Um, to follow up on what I can't remember if it was Representative Seed or Representative Guttenberg said earlier, the effects of the fast track on the overall budget process, how much does that help? speed, smooth, whatever you want to call it, that process? Well, I would just say that, you know, it takes and gets some of the issues off the table, the ones that there's no disagreement on. And so that's always helpful. I mean, that's, that's about it. I mean, it, these things can wait until the end, but these are supplementals for 2018, our current budget. In other words, there were holes there. So if a supplemental budget doesn't move through fairly fast, they may have to hold up payments for things that they are committed to pay for because services have been provided. In fact, most of those services are statutorily required, so they're going to be provided, and it's much better to have the providers of those services get the money as, as they're going instead of waiting. Well, look what happens in the legislative process. As you're going down, more and more things get rolled to the end. The burden of getting out comes heavier and heavier weighted towards the end of session. You start dealing with these things early on, the chance of success to getting out in 90 days is increased. The chance of doing our work in time it, it, um, increases. If we just keep rolling everything to the end, the burden of the final days gets more and more cumbersome, harder to get out, and um, and th the point is that let's do our work on time and get out of here. So the combination of the fast track plus the early funding of education would take care of a large portion of our budget that we can all agree on. Any additional questions? Well, I think there is a hand up. Becky? Just a timing issue for the speaker. Do you anticipate um, Ms. Zuklowski, um being here before the, the budget vote? Yes, we do. Um, you know, first off, I'd like to say we're very pleased that she's uh, uh, coming down. I think she's going to be a great representative. Uh, 
a young Alaska Native woman who's uh, born and raised in uh, the YK uh, region of the state and somebody with some really strong uh, academic and professional credentials. And, um, you know, we recognize that when you ask somebody to sort of set their life aside and become a legislator, it's going to take some time uh, for that transition. And uh, so we've been working with her. Uh, we expect her to be sworn in uh, probably uh, next week. I think we're targeting uh, March 9th. And um, that will get her in office uh, a scant a couple of days before the operating budget uh, is on the floor. But uh, unlike Representative Sponholtz from a few years ago, at least she won't land right in the middle of the debate uh, that went till like 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but so the answer is uh, yes, she'll be um, in place and uh, be uh, part of uh, the floor debate on the operating budget. Well, with that, thank you all. Uh, next week we'll be here and we will start at our normal 9 a.m. Uh, starting time. So thank you once again.